More fallout from the Ascroft trade as Anne and Emma from Locked On Preds join to discuss Ascroft and what this means for both franchises. Your Locked On Sharks, your daily podcast on the San Jose Sharks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, welcome to Locked On Sharks, the premier hockey podcast covering your favorite team in the Bay Area. My name is J.D. Young, caretaker at the Reef, also the co-host of Western Conference Tuesdays here at the Locked On Angel Channel. I want to thank you for making Locked On Sharks your first listen, proudly part of the Locked On Network. We cover your team every day. And if you want to be an everyday, all you have to do is just follow wherever you get podcasts or you can watch on YouTube as well. And I'm joined by the ladies from Locked On Preds, where we dive into the Ascroft trade. We look at it from both sides. We look at, you know, kind of what this means for the Preds, why now, uh, look at it for the Sharks, and why Ascroft solves the biggest question in their prospect pool pipeline. Uh, and then we look at how this changes, I think, for each franchise and kind of where they're heading from here. So before we get to all that, do want to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday Ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. And now we bring in the locked on Predtos, Emma and Ann, uh, to class up this joint so that way you guys don't have to look at my dumb face for the like you guys always do. So Emma Ann, how are you guys doing today? Doing well. How are you? Excited. I'm guessing you're excited. It's been a great weekend. I about every 20 minutes or so, I just start laughing uncontrollably, and my wife is really mad at me about it. But then I'm just like, oh yeah. The Sharks got Askarov, and I just keep laughing. We were in Target, and I just started laughing for no reason. It was great. Uh, so we're going to talk about the Askarov trade and kind of look at it from the point of view of both teams uh, and kind of how it maybe changes this season and beyond for both. So let's start with Friday afternoon. What was your initial reaction when you saw it coming down? I'll start with you, Emma. I think our initial reaction was, are you kidding me? Friday afternoon? Like, come on, Barry. We, it was like 3 p.m. Central on a Friday. We're like, seriously? Uh, but yeah, it was, you know, I think it was it was pretty quick, uh, you know, from when the public trade request was made to, you know, when it actually happened. And I think that speaks a lot to uh, Barry Trotz probably wanting to get it out of his hair, you know, just get everything off the table, out of the way before training camp, before any of that, you know, don't want to head into camp with any sort of extracurricular drama. So I think that is probably the reason for why it happened as quickly as it did. But yeah, I, I'd say our, I, I think I can speak for Ann too. And I say we were both like, seriously, Friday afternoon, come on, Barry. <laughs> The most news dumpy of news dumpy times right there. The perfect Friday afternoon news dump. So that's one of the nice things about living on the West Coast. Uh, it was like lunchtime. I was literally just sitting down to eat lunch. And then, uh, yeah, that started coming across. But uh, when you saw the, and I was going to hear, so when you saw the, the actual return, were you surprised? Were you like kind of, how well, how did you kind of process the actual return? So the return, just a reminder, uh, Magnus Crota, uh, a the 2025 first round pick from Vegas, which is a top 10 protect. Basically, if it's in the top 10, the Sharks can choose to send theirs or Vegas's uh, pick as well as uh, what am I forgetting? Uh, who David Edstrom and David Edstrom, uh, who the Sharks acquired in the Tomas hurdle trade. So what was your initial thought when you saw those pieces coming back? I actually felt really good about it uh, because I think it meets Nashville where they're at. And I think, People in Nashville were nervous about when this came out and when Askarov was like, look, I'm not going to the AHL. I think then people felt like, is Barry Trotz going to be able to get anything out of this situation? And I feel like he really did. Uh, I First of all, as a Swede, 
loving that we get two <laughs> Swedes. So I'm here yes. for that. But also, I think it's really important that if you are going to trade your first round draft pick, your 2020 first round draft pick, you want to get something of equal value. And they got a first round draft pick in this, as well as two players that I think uh, have potential to really meet a need for Nashville down the road. And that's where Nashville's at. They're they're needing a couple of pieces down the road. And Edstrom and Krona, I think, really help fill in some spaces that Nashville may be looking at. So while it may not appear on the surface to be a glamorous trade return mm -hmm. for the Nashville Predators for Yaroslav Askarov, I do feel like there was a good value for Nashville. Again, not glamorous. We didn't get Macklin Celebrini. I noticed. Sorry, so you guys. Know, noticed you uh, didn't trade him to us. Yeah, but, that was a that was a definite no on that. <laughs> That was a hard no pass. For me, dog. Yeah. <laughs> that was a hard pass. But I do feel like even though it may, uh, you know, not appear as glamorous as I think a lot of people felt like Yaroslav Askarov should have gotten, I feel like it was a good value. And and I think for both parties, I think both parties can walk away Friday afternoon feeling like we've done a good job getting what we needed. Yeah. I mean, Emma, what did you think? Same thing kind of, or where were you at with it? Yeah. I mean... I think you got to look at people were kind of expecting or wondering if maybe this would be more of an NHL trade where they would get NHL uh, level talent in, in return. And I was thinking, I mean, even before the, the return was announced, even before the trade even happened, I was thinking this is going to be, it's going to be a prospect swap, I think, because you're, the Predators don't have a lot of cap space right now. They still have three RFAs who have yet to be signed. They also have, you know, they did manage to get Cody Glass's contract off the books this summer. So that's two and a half million. That's something, but it's not a ton. And so, you know, any precious little cap space that you have, you probably want to preserve. And so I think there wasn't, in my mind, there wasn't going to be an NHL return unless they also managed to offload another NHL contract with Askarov. Um, but, you know, there there really wasn't anyone where that would make sense. And so I think that I agree. I think it's good that they got a first round pick in return because, you know, if you're going to trade a first round pick, you need to get a first round pick, whether it's in the form of a prospect who was drafted in the first round or a future pick. And then as we've talked about at locked on predators beyond a scar off, really not a whole lot of uh, depth at goaltender um, in, in Milwaukee for the predators. So I think it's good that they were able to get a goaltender back, you know, a goaltender who has experience in the AHL, NHL, mm -hmm. NHL, all of that. So I think, you know, overall, and, and then again, they, they do have need, uh, like organizational need for depth at center. So I think it kind of hits all three of those. And I think it was, you know, given given the situation, I think that it was a very, very solid return. Yeah, I, I was in the same boat as you. I thought it was going to be more of an NHL trade. And the Sharks, who do have a ton of cap space, can kind of take on whatever bad contract. Like, that doesn't matter to them. The cap space doesn't matter, especially when you have, uh, like, Will Smith, Mac and Brady, William Mack, all these guys on their ELCs, like that's fine. They can take on bad caps. So that's why I thought was probably going to happen where the Sharks would send a like actual, like good NHL player. They do have a couple of those on the roster here and there. If you look, uh, I thought there was because the, the Preds this year are very much in like a win now mode, right? You, especially with the offseason they had getting Stamkos, like all the offseason signings, it felt very much like, okay, well, we're going to take Askrov, who doesn't want to be here and isn't going to help us win this year. Can we get some make the most of this situation and try to get something that'll actually help us win this year? So I was a little bit surprised to see um the sharks trading prospects uh and, and picks. And we'll, we'll talk, I can kind of give my my deep dive on Edstrom and, and Magnus Corona here in a couple minutes, but like uh I, I think though for the Preds, I still think you've kind of made the best of the situation of a really bad situation because they were stuck between a rock and a hard place. And you know, they kind of made that choice when they signed UC Saros to a big contract. And for Askarov, like you you knew you're never gonna be the guy, right? He was just never going to be the guy in Nashville. And when you're a former first round pick and you know, you have kind of been the guy your whole life. I can understand why you want out and go get a chance to kind of go earn your own version of that big contract here. So, uh, yeah, I think though for the Preds, like 
getting Estrom, who was a former first round pick, getting that Vegas pick, who uh, I think we're all very much on team crash and burn for Vegas. Uh, please, please let it be this year. Like this is, I think you, you're given a lot of stuff where you can, if you make that pick or if you trade it at the trade deadline to get someone to help you win a uh, sailing cup this year, the Preds are still in a really good situation when it comes to kind of their picks and uh, their assets minus not having the best or second best goaltender goaltending prospect uh, in the world. So we'll jump over to the Sharks point of view of this and kind of see what uh, I mean, I'm just going to cackle for the next 10 minutes uh, what I thought about it, but uh, we'll get to that here in just one second. You've heard us talk a lot about FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Well, I have a little something different for you now. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5, get a three-week trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube on YouTube TV. So if you're like me, you don't get to watch your beloved Dolphins because I live in California with YouTube TV. I can watch my Dolphins every week uh, and enjoy it in September and cry in December as I normally do. So with the YouTube uh, TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon at a market game. All you need is a Google account and a current form of payment, and you can cancel at any time. Just visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to download America's number one sportsbook. All right. I'm just going to say uh, I love this trade. <laughs> for the sharks uh i mean okay well we'll let's start with the pieces that the sharks gave up right so you gave up uh magnus krona who i feel is very much if he's your third goalie in in the your kind of system i think that's a good like that's kind of where he fits in where right? if you need him to play some nhl games he can play some nhl games if he's playing mostly ahl games he can do that for the preds right you you've kind of you're gonna be playing paying stars for a long time you need a cheap goalie backup Magnus Krona can do that for the Sharks. David Edstrom is probably was going to be their four C. If you look at right, you have Michael Salvarini, Will Smith, Philip. He said uh, he was probably going to be their four C. He's very good defensively. Um, I think there's a little bit more of his offensive game. He can uh, kind of get to. He's going to play one more year in Frolunda, and then he's going to be making his jump over to North America, just like Phil Beestead did with San Jose last year. So I expect if, uh, to see David Edstrom in Milwaukee sometime this spring. Uh, and but like, and you have a 2025 fifth uh, first round pick that you traded. And yes, that stinks for the Sharks as they're still kind of uh, looking to work on this rebuild. But you weren't going to find a goalie as good as Askarov with that pick. Like, I think for the Sharks, this is a home run trade. It makes exact sense for where they're at. Um, am I being too optimistic here? You know, that's a that's a great question. And I think you, we had said on our reaction video, this is one of those trades that we're going to want to look back on in four, five, six years and really do a deep dive into it. Because yeah. right now, there is great potential for both teams to walk away from this uh, with things looking very well. Here is what I will say. I don't think there is any doubt that Yaroslav Skarov is an NHL caliber goaltender. So I do think you are getting an NHL caliber goaltender. The caveat to that and kind of where we have discussed is the process with which he has gone through to get to San Jose, to get an opportunity to become the guy in the NHL. I do, I'm not going to say that it changes his, uh, it stunts his growth ultimately. Mm -hmm. But I do think that he has chosen a little bit of a harder path. And that's not at all a criticism of San Jose, because I think timing wise, from the outside looking in, this is a great fit for where San Jose is. And, and as you guys are developing and getting back to being a contender, I think he fits in that timeline really, really well. Yep. On ice. Really oh, the amazing. sharks stink. He's going to get they <laughs> stink this year. There, he's going to get. Uh, he's going to see more two on ones uh, this season than he's probably seen in his entire life because that defense, uh, whether it's the sharks or the barracuda that he plays on, they stink. Uh, yeah, that's that's the life of playing behind a 
bad team. I love that they stink. Well, here's here's what I will say. I'm not sure how willing he's going to be to put time in with the Barracuda because he sure wasn't he, willing to even go to training camp. So Mike Greer did say at his press availability that they talked to him and he is willing to go to San Jose or he willing to be, play on the Barracuda. I think he was using that pool as like a don't send me back there. Uh, but I, I think for him, the path to playing NHL, like he's going to play NHL games this season because sure. you have Mackenzie Blackwood and Vitek Vancheck are both in the last year of their deals. Neither one of them are the healthiest guys alive. Like he's going to play NHL games and even uh, Mike Greer said, like, we are even discussing potentially playing, uh, keeping all three goalies on the roster, which I think is a terrible move, especially because you can just send Askarov back and forth, like, no problem. It's it's literally right down the hall. It's not like you have to, you know, since the Sharks and the Barracuda both play in the, at, you know, in, in San Jose. Um, but for him, I think he's going to be playing. I think he's going to start the season in the Barracuda. And then when one of those guys get hurt slash traded, um, he'll be playing like he's I would ex I would put the over under at like 15 NHL games for him this year. I think that's kind of where I would put the over under for him as, as games start uh, NHL games. And I think that's I think for him, it was I just need to see a path forward to me playing in, like realistic NHL games for him. Right. And I don't blame him for wanting that. I, I just yeah. think as somebody who has raised 20 year olds, I think sometimes they want to get where they want to get really. And quick. I want to do it now. Anne. And I want to do it now. And, and if you say, well, what about this? They'll say, I got this. And, and, and so, you know, Godspeed, I do think that he could have gotten more out of his time in Nashville before making a move. Yeah. But he just, you know, he, he wasn't ready for that. So, you know, I, I think, in those NHL games, however many he plays, I think it'll be interesting to see how his aggressive style does. Yeah, uh, I don't know, Emma. What, what, what? How do you evaluate it? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think we've talked about it. Like, it was difficult to see a path forward for him in Nashville. It was difficult to blame him for wanting to go somewhere where he had a clearer path forward. Not like we're not faulting him for that. I think it was just maybe the execution and the way he went about it, where it was like yeah. you still could have really benefited from one more year. Like, we're not asking you to do anything outlandish here. We're asking you to follow the same development path that many other NHL goaltenders have followed before you. So, like, frankly, don't care if you're a first round pick. Like, you have a clean slate. If you very well may be the guy but mm. prove it like you know and and i think that he absolutely he has the skill for sure has the skill um but skill isn't everything as we've seen so i think that he does have a little bit of growing up to do um yeah. and and i think that you know i i agree i think san jose is a much better fit for him in terms of getting that pathway that he wants where even if he does start the year or even play the whole year with the barracuda it's like next year he'll be in the NHL. Like it's, it's a much clearer pathway than it was in Nashville. And so I, I think it makes sense for him, but I do agree. It was maybe a little bit. Yeah. I want it and I want it now and you can't stop me and you can't tell me, I don't know what I'm talking about. And it's like, yeah. okay. and you know, we, we wish him the best. We love that kid to be love clear. him. Absolutely love him. You will love him in training camp, in like any interviews, he is an absolute gem. So have fun with that. But I think that, um, yeah, it's, it will be interesting. I was, uh, so I was traveling with the team at the time that he made his NHL debut in the 22-23 mm -hmm. season in Montreal. And uh, I just remember sitting, watching our, uh, the Predators video coach, like having fits just watching this guy and and how far he comes out of the crease and even I, i'm like what are you doing <laughs> get back there and it's just it's a very unique style obviously he's very different than like you see sorrows for example famously not the biggest guy so he doesn't nope. really play far out of the crease and but he's very explosive you know he can move yep. side to side really quickly very athletic askarov bigger likes to 
almost join the rush. It seems like sometimes he likes to go on an adventure, as we said. He, oh, does. <laughs> he does. He he does not like to sit still. And so um, just watching the Predators video coaches watch him was actually hilarious. Um, but I think that, you know, it's a very unique style of play. And I think that if you're in a system that gets accustomed to that and playing in front of that. And, you know, especially like you said, if he's playing with kind of a flimsy defense, you might see him out at center ice half the time, I think, uh, cause he'll just take matters into his own hands. Um, but that's not, you know, and, and I don't the mean to, say- to celebrate you one timer is going to be insane. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like it could happen. I would not put it past him, honestly. <laughs> like, um, but yeah, he like he he likes to take matters into his own hands. And, you know, that's it's we actually spoke with uh, Milwaukee's head coach, Carl Taylor, on mm -hmm. our show last week and uh, asked him about, you know, what it's like coaching him or how does it make you feel as a coach when he's making those, you know, kind of. Yeah when he's going on those adventures, um, like how, how is that for you as a coach? And he said something to the effect of, you know, if you make a risky move like that, if you go like it, maybe like there's a one in a hundred chance that it'll bite you. It, it'll yeah. come back to bite you. But there's also a 99 in a hundred chance that it'll be a really good move. So do you really want to like, eliminate the possibility of those other 99 just to save the one mistake. Like you're obviously going to make some mistakes when you play like that and that's fine. Um, so I think it's just like getting him with a team, with a system that is, you know, accustomed to him playing the way that he does because you're not, it's clear by now you're not going to coach that out of him. So I think that, you know, it's better if you can't beat him, join him. <laughs> yeah. It's the uh, Eric Carlson effect, right? Uh, right? Yeah. <laughs> Eric Carlson, 99% of the time, he's going to do something really awesome. But 1% of the time, uh, it's just not going to work. But yeah. it's Eric Carlson. And Eric Carlson is one of the few people in the world who's going to be able to pull off the cool stuff like that. So I think you just kind of have to live with it. So uh, before we take a break here, uh, I know a big question for Sharks fans, right, is the playoffs for Milwaukee this year, where Askarov kind of lost his job you know i think he, he played five games uh in it milwaukee went on a very very deep run this year was this uh Askarov being injured fatigue did he lose his job like kind of anything that can maybe explain why he you would expect a young goaltender would want to get or a, an organization would want to get a young goaltender like Askarov as big game situations like the playoffs what happened no way knows. <laughs> well, Emma and I are like, who wants to say it? <laughs> so and. there's a couple, there's a couple of things. So this was the second time that the Milwaukee Admirals had made it to the Western Conference Finals in the last two years. Both years, Yaroslav Askarov in the Western Conference Finals lost to Starters Net. Uh, the first year to Devin Cooley, the second year last year to Troy Grosnick. Now Oh, whispers ties still <laughs> yeah i know it's it's we just keep circling back yes. to the same people uh the word was there was an injury to yaroslava okay. scarf in the western conference final now it was very vague information on there was an injury and when i was up there in game four he was you know full practice mm -hmm. all of that kind of thing but did not play again and so you can say that it was injury related this year probably can't say that about the year that Devin Cooley took over and then the Western Conference Finals. I think probably it is more likely that they the the team felt a little bit more comfortable in the big moments with Devin Cooley and Troy Grosnick. Would you say that's fair, Emma? Is that the nicest way to say it? <laughs> Yeah, I think that's very diplomatic. Well done. I think, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, Troy Grosnick, veteran, and and yep. Cooley even had a, a year or two on him. So I think that it, you know, it, it did make sense. I think, again, this is speculation at this point, but it's educated speculation just from watching him and, and you know, kind of seeing how he plays. I think one thing that we've talked about with Askarov is that He's a very emotional player. He plays mm -hmm. with a lot of passion, a lot of emotion, which can be his greatest strength. 
Uh, but I think it can also be his greatest downfall sometimes because you need to be able to channel that emotion and channel that that passion. Sometimes the emotion gets the best of you. And it's uh, when that happens, you can't really reel it back in. It's like we've already gone past the point of no return. And so I kind of feel like, again, educated speculation uh, would not surprise me if that was the case. Um, you know, maybe injury played a part of it. But like Ann said, he was, you know, he was still practicing fully. There was no formal report of him having an injury. Um, yeah, I just again, that kind of goes back to what I said earlier he has the skill, but skill isn't everything. And yes, he put together back-to-back all-star seasons with Milwaukee, Mm -hmm. but then back-to-back playoffs, he just couldn't get it done. And so it's maybe, you know, playing in a, a environment like San Jose might be better for him. It's a lower pressure environment, um, you know, might be better for him to, um, you know, kind of build up and develop in that way. But I think it was a good experience for him to to get those playoff games for sure. Yep. But I think that, yeah, I if I were a betting woman, I would bet that he was probably not injured seriously enough to where uh, he really needed to not play in the Western Conference final. Uh, maturity issue. And I mean, how many 21, 22 year old kids uh, still have some maturity issues. So uh, something to watch as uh, he continues his development. So we're going to kind of talk about how this trade changes the shark season, uh, how it trade changes the bread season and kind of where each team goes from here. So we'll get to that here in just one second. Passion, drive, and patience. Friends, that's the formula for winning championships. It's also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you are into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com eligible items only exclusions apply ebay guaranteed fit only available to u.s customers all right uh let's finish up by kind of looking at how this trade affects the 2024 2025 sharks slash preds so we'll start with the preds uh because i think it's still I think it's more interesting uh, of the two because we know Askarov, he's going to help the Sharks. But Askarov really wasn't in the plans to help the Preds this year, really, right? Like the the goal the, was, the, I guess the plan was to have him go back to Milwaukee, play in Milwaukee if you need him to kind of come up because somebody gets hurt. You know, you have Scott Wedgwood under contract for the next two season. UC Saros is under uh, contract until the sun explodes. <laughs> when, what... How does this trade, I think, kind of change the direction of the Preds this season? I think you hit the nail on the head. I'm not sure that it tr- changes too much. And I think that was part of the frustration with Yaroslav Askarov because he was not going to factor into where Nashville is at. Once July 1st hit and Barry Trotz went shopping, everything changed for the Nashville Predators, including what was going to happen in net. And so they are in more of a win now mode. If you have mm-hmm. Yaroslav Askarov as your backup, what you want from him is to gain NHL experience. When you sign Scott Wedgwood to a two-year deal, what you expect from him as a backup is to keep winning games. And that's what Nashville needs right now. So the trade short term, I don't think really impacts too much with Nashville. Again, if you do get an injury, you're looking at a very different, uh, you know, 3A, 3B kind of guy with Magnus Krona than you would have with Yaroslav Askarov. But experience wise, you're probably getting a little bit more experience with Krona than you were with your Slava Skarov as well. Short term, I don't know that this changes a ton for Nashville. Yeah, I think that 
I, like I said before, I think the biggest short-term impact for Nashville is that they don't have this drama hanging over their heads <laughs> yes. heading into training 100%. camp. Quite frankly, like that's the biggest thing is the biggest storyline. And now, because if you think about it, it's not just about a scar off. It's not fair to the rest of the players too, whether they're Nashville players or Milwaukee players, they have mm-hmm. this hanging, you know, this Paul hanging over them too, that they don't know what's going on. And, you know, it's, it's hard to kind of plan for a season that way. And so I think that now there's a little bit more steadiness and just knowing what, you know, what's what heading into camp. And I think that that's, that's going to be really valuable. And then, you know, I think for, we've, we've talked about how, yes, like Barry went shopping on July 1st and that really kind of changed the timeline for this team exponentially um, yep. that, you know, they are in win now mode. And, and I think that that was pretty clear. That's when it became pretty clear. Cause I think it all hinged on UC Soros signing him to that contract, because if they hadn't signed him to an extension, then that would indicate the direction that this team is going in. It's like, all right, we're not trying to win right now. We're probably not trying to win in the next five years. Um, mm-hmm. And that's when you would go with a scar off, bring him up, let him get his experience, you know, in a, in that low pressure environment. Once they signed Soros, that changed everything because something that we've said, I, that I believe to be true is that you don't get Steven Stamkos, Jonathan Marcia. So Brady Shea, you don't get those guys if Yaroslav Askarov is your starting goaltender. Like, I just, I don't think that that is unreasonable to say. So I think that once the UC Soros shoe dropped, I think that was kind of what set everything else in motion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, unfortunately for Askarov, that did mean that he was kind of the odd man out. So it's, I think that, like you said, it's not going to change much for Nashville this year. Um, you know, they are looking, they're in kind of a, a interesting situation because yes, they're in win now mode, but to go get all those pieces, the, you know, the Stamkos and Marcia so and all of that, they really didn't have to give up many assets or like they yeah. didn't have to leverage their future to go get that. And so the idea here is that you want that window of contention to be open for a long time. And that's kind of where a guy like Edstrom might fit in, you know, in the, in the next several years where he could still be part of that. So I think that overall it's, it's a good, you know, good move for Nashville and it doesn't really impact them too much uh, in the immediate future. Yeah, and I think, uh, of course, you have three first-round picks heading into the trade deadline. If Nashville gets out to a fast start and they realize this is our year, you can do whatever you want with three first-round picks. Uh, yeah, you you can be you can basically outbid anybody uh, for whomever could be potentially available. Uh, Mario Ferraro for first question? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, but no, like they're 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 set up where they can kind of have their cake and eat it too, where they can compete for. A championship you know this year next year and then also still be able to draft high or draft you know uh good talent or trade that those pick like they they can the world is nashville's oyster this this season and they're gonna be one of the most intriguing teams uh to kind of figure out how they navigate this and, and i know they have a bajillion dollars in dead cap space right now that they're still kind of processing but uh you can you can figure stuff out with the cap like they can they can figure out if they want to if they want to get a guy they'll be able to figure out how to get a guy on on their team so um from the sharks point of view like this trade solved their biggest question in their pipeline uh and who is the goaltender of the future and the sharks have been terrible at drafting slash developing uh goalies uh nabakov was the last guy that they were able to do that with um you know if you look back even martin jones that they traded for who was a guy kind of like askarov situation where he's ready to to kind of make that jump uh martin jones was good until he turned into a pumpkin you know and then the last couple of years they've been riding some of these veteran guys like james reimer mackenzie blackwood etc cetera, etc cetera. you you've solved that now you have uh you have the best prospect pool in the NHL right now. And I will fight people uh, on that because, I mean, you have Macklin Celebrity, you have Will Smith, uh, you have Quentin Musty, you have Sam Dickinson, you have Askarov, uh, Philip B. said, I'm just naming first round picks. I haven't even started naming guys who are picked in the second round, like, you know, Casper Hulson. Uh, you, you, you are sure to show, like, 
this team is going to they're going to stink this year but uh the future is teal as they keep saying and this team is this was i think the final piece for that prospect puzzle and this team is now going to start to flirt with the fun uh fun team that, that everyone's going to start to get behind and hopefully here in the next couple seasons um this team will no longer be the doormat of the nhl and you're going to start to see them kind of make their way to be in the contender and having that long-term sustainable success and i think my career in a short amount of time has turned this franchise around so uh, and i think this is just a cherry on top of what's been in a pretty uh pretty awesome summer for the sharks <laughs> Yeah, you guys have, uh, you've got a lot to look forward to. <laughs> yes. You really so do. And, and timing is everything. And that's why I think this trade for both teams, the timing of it has really hit well. And so I think it's going to be interesting short term to see what happens with Nashville. But I agree with you. I think San Jose is going to be a heck of a lot of fun to watch in the next couple seasons. You know, Losing all those games. This is why you lose all those games. So, and yeah, the timing of it, uh, having a trade dump at, you know, on a Friday afternoon in the middle of August, uh, you know, it, thanks Barry. Yeah. Good job, Mike Greer. Way to make it happen. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming to hang on, classing up the joint here at locked on sharks. Uh, where can the people find you Anne and Emma and find the show? Of course. You can find the show on social media, LO underscore Predators. Of course, we're on your favorite uh, podcasting platform. We're on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe there. You can find me online at Ann K underscore Mama on Ice. And you can find me at Emma underscore Lingan. Of course, you can find Locked on Sharks wherever you listen to podcasts and watch on YouTube as well. Follow the show on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Locked on Sharks. You can uh, also follow me on Twitter at MyFryHole. Uh, until next time, bye, friends. 